Good morning, everybody. As we begin our service today, I want to, uh, I want to read a passage from the book of Lamentations. And uh, if you've ever read that book, you know that most of it is very dreary, very sad, very dark, because it's a time uh, in Israel's history where um, the people had rebelled against God and he was allowing other nations, he was removing his protection and allowing other nations um, to overtake them. And, um, but there's this really cool set of verses kind of stuck in the middle there. And as they're going through all of this suffering, um, the writer says these words. So let's stand together and read these together as we think about God's faithfulness and his provision even in the darkest of times or in the times where we feel like we can't see him. Sometimes we have to remember. Let's read this together. The thought of my suffering and homelessness is bitter beyond words. I will never forget this awful time as I grieve over my loss. Yet I still dare to hope when I remember this, the faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh each morning. I say to myself, the Lord is my inheritance. Therefore, I will hope in him. God, as we come together today, we pray that you would help us to hope in you that you would help us to trust you for all that we need and that you would help us, Lord, um, to be able to remember all that you've done throughout history for your people. Be with us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Great is our faith. 
I want you to think back to a time where you saw God show up in your life. And that's what this song is based off of. It's based off of a psalm that remembers all the different things that God did um, in the history of his people. And it says, his love endures forever in response to each one of those things. So think about that. Let your mind consider where you've seen God show up and remember that he is continuing to be faithful in our lives even when we can't necessarily see it or feel it. your hands if you like. It's, it's not too early, is it? for 
you are faithful forever you are faithful forever you are strong forever you are with us forever and ever forever you are faithful forever you are strong forever you are with us forever, forever, forever. You are strong, you are strong, so faithful. We trust you, Lord. Amen. Yes, Lord, you alone.
trust you in all seasons. Help us to know that your plans are best. Lord, help us to give our lives to testify to your faithfulness. Help us to seek your kingdom first, Lord. We love you. We thank you that you loved us first. Be here among us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Welcome to Christ Church. My name is John. I'm the pastor of Christ Church, and we are a strategic partner of Grace Chapel in Lexington on a mission to celebrate people, pursue wholeness, and discover God. If this is your first time visiting with us, we're really excited and glad that you can join us this Sunday, and we would just ask you after service if you would take a moment and fill out one of our welcome cards at the Welcome Center out in the foyer so that we can get to know you a little bit and so that we can be praying for you throughout the week. A few announcements here this week at Christ Church. First, in one week, someone very special will be joining us here as an intern, Zoe Biakis from Namibia will be joining us as an intern here, so it's going to be a great opportunity as a cross-cultural learning experience, and we're really excited to have her for about five months. So uh, we would invite you, congregation members, to sign up out in the foyer for an opportunity to host her, get to know her, and just help her acclimate to a completely different culture than than Africa. So we would love it if you take, took a moment after service, looked at that list for those spots that are still empty and considered filling one of those in. In lieu of our kids' connection this summer, we're offering a unique opportunity for our, pre- for our preschoolers uh, that are Uh, that we are calling Kids Summer Blast. That's going on right now, and if you want to send your kids out or you want to keep them in the service, that's completely up to you, but you can check them in at the Child Check-In Center in the foyer, and that'll be going on for several weeks. Uh, Kids will be reading stories together, doing something fun, and going outside if the heat isn't like 95 degrees or something like it's been lately. So uh, that's an awesome opportunity for the summer for your kids to have fun. Uh, We'll be taking... We'll be having next week, after service, July 15th, a very important congregational meeting. We'll be sharing with you some of the updates, that, uh, some of the things that we are planning on doing in the future, and we'll also be introducing a very important voting issue, so we encourage you to come and stop by if you are able to do that. Uh, just a note about the use of the playground out and back. We love it that we're able to use that, but for parents, uh, please make sure you have your kids put the toys back where they belong so that uh, the preschool that meets here during the week uh, doesn't have to clean that up for us. Uh, finally, Theology on Tap is a, it's a great opportunity to have a drink and join a group of people for a conversation on a theological perspective of an issue facing our culture. And tomorrow that will be meeting at 7 p.m. at Union Coffee. And the topic is, how should we think theologically about America's place in the world? I'm going to invite Jesse up to share a few words about Compassion International. So many of you know that we've had the compassion table out. This is our third week in the back here in the sanctuary. And I just want to thank those who have chosen to sponsor a child. We've had uh, three sponsorships so far. Um, And I know a few of you also took some packet, uh, some pamphlets to consider and and learn a little bit more about the ministry. Um, And so I just want to continue to encourage you. Maybe it's been something that's on your mind and maybe you just forgot to get a packet or maybe you've been sort of weighing it a little bit. And, you know, it's, it's $38 a month to sponsor these kids. And it's it's a very holistic approach, um, and you know I can testify, having sponsored four children over the years, um, that it's just amazing to see uh, what happens in these these kids' lives. And literally, I mean, it, it's kind of a scary thing to think, but in a sense, sometimes ultimately it's in God's hands. But in a sense, it's sort of like you could be their only hope at this point in their lives. Um, and so I just want to encourage you, if, if maybe you've been thinking about it, or maybe you haven't been, and, and today I'm saying, give it a chance. You know, it, it's, it's a little more than a dollar a day to literally change these children's lives uh, in Jesus' name. So thank you again to those who have chosen to sponsor, and I will be back at that table at the end of the service if you'd like to come and, and see some of the packets that we have to choose from ch- for children. Thanks.
guys want to watch that for a little bit longer? (laughs) Last week, uh, Pastor Tom started our series called The Chase. Uh, It's about the things that we chase after in life that make us feel like we're a hamster on a wheel going forever and ever, not making any progress and not finding a whole lot of meaning in life. And we're going to continue that series today. I was just thinking the other week about some of my some of the my favorite gifts over the years, some of the favorite things that I have been given. Maybe it's part of my personality, but I just love being given or love having something that's super practical and that I use in a lot of ways that I might have expected or a lot of ways that I might not have expected. That's that's the kind of guy that I am. So I remember one of my favorite gifts from high school was a TI-83 calculator nerd, I know, that my mom gave me as a senior. I could use it in my algebra class. I used it in calculus in college, and I used it to complete all sorts of calculations that I have no idea about anymore or can't even remember how to do. And my second favorite gift after that was a gift that my wife and my in-laws gave me. It was a DeWalt cordless power drill. I mean, there's like nothing you can't do with one of these. You can, you can fix the boards on your deck. You can go ahead and fix squeaky floorboards in your house. The DeWalt drill. Zoom, zoom, it's amazing. But recently, I've had a, a little bit of an upgrade. My new favorite super practical tool that I can use in so many amazing ways is, uh, is this. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you guys are familiar with this. I, I've had a lot of time to study this. Uh, it's, it's amazing the engineering behind one of these things. They're designed just perfectly so that when it goes in your child's mouth and, and she falls asleep, it just it falls out, or if she's kind of not really chewing on it, it doesn't stay there so it won't choke her. Although, I gotta admit at times, I wish it would just stay there <laughs> a, a lot more. Um, it has this tab on the back that's That's really clever. So if you drop it, you don't have to pick it up by the sucky side and get your germs all over it. You can just pick it up like that. It has two holes in it so that it improves improves, uh, suction. You can actually kind of see through this. So if you're really bored, you can watch your child and it's like like a fish kind of (laughs) doing that. And you know that tab and those little two two holes, they, they come together to make a smiley face, right? Amazing. (laughs) <laughs> Amazing piece of engineering. Um, with all that's going on in the world, with the troubles that we seem to have in our culture politically, uh, the tensions over immigration nationally, uh, internationally, the personal problems that you face at home and that we face here in southern New Hampshire, uh, I, I have to wonder, do they make one of these for adults? <laughs> Because sometimes it feels like we could really use something to help pacify the problems and the challenges that we have, especially because of the instabilities that we all face at different times. Some of you live paycheck to paycheck. It's difficult to know uh, whether you'll ever find a job that's going to give you the security that you hope for. Uh, Some of you have a good job, but you're worried about the, and you feel the, and experience the insecurities that are coming because you might potentially be laid off. There are others of you here who, who, who maybe feel a lot more security in your job, but you worry that when you go to work every day, the atmosphere there is taking a little bit of a piece of you away, or that this is in a place where you feel good about being on a daily basis. Maybe it's not money at all. Maybe it's relationships. Maybe it's your marriage. It might look to some really good on the outside, but on the inside, the warmth has disappeared, and you wonder, what's coming next? Is there something down the road that I haven't considered yet? Some of you are experiencing singleness at a time in your life that you never expected to experience singleness, and it's difficult because of the loneliness that you feel. But you, but you wonder... And you have this fear that, that tomorrow it's not going to look any different, that it's going to continue to simply be the same. Maybe some of you are at the point in your life, maybe, you're, maybe you've approached or attained retirement where finances, they aren't such a concern anymore, or in your relationships seem to be full of life, and they seem to be full of joy. But there's always the concern of your kids, 
Are they going to, are they going to prosper? Are they going to find a way through all of the difficulties? Will they, will they be able to latch on to the faith that you hope to pass on so dearly to them? And frankly, all of us at one time or another, we have something that we can always be concerned about. A major health issue could come. Something that could happen to a loved one. There is always something that we could be worried about because of the instabilities that, that surround us. Chances are you, you're like me, and it would just be nice to have a little bit of stability for once, right? It would be nice to have rhythm at work, to know what to expect, and to kind of be on top of your work pile. It would, it would be nice to be on the back end of a mortgage instead of the front end of a mortgage. It would be nice to have harmony in your family and your relationships. Wouldn't it be nice? <laughs> Wouldn't stability and peace and harmony and not, not always thinking about tomorrow, wouldn't that be a great thing? Now, some of you might call that the good life. Others of you might call it a bit naive. So the question that we have today that we ask because we're asking it as a lot is how can we, how can we pacify ourselves in the face of so many instabilities in our life, potential instabilities or potential insecurities? Jesus is going to answer that question for us in Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. We're going to get there in a moment, so if you have your phones, you can pop up your Bible apps, or if you have a Bible, you'd like a Bible in the back, uh, you can go ahead and start turning to that passage. Matthew 6, verses 25 through 34. But before we go there, I would just like to talk, have a little bit of a talk with you just about worry. In the Bible, worry is often paired with two other words, anxiety and fear. And it's also pitted against the word frequently, faith. We see it pitted against faith. We know that worry has real practical consequences, physical consequences in the world. has been established medically that there's a correlation between worry and anxiety and heart disease and progressive heart disease. One affects the other and so on. But worry also has real effects on how we think, feel, and interact in our relationships with one another. Uh, I, I read, I've, been, I've been reading a book, uh, it's called The Blessed Are the Misfits, Great News for Believers Who Are Introverts, Spiritual Strugglers, or Just Feel Like They Are Missing Something by Brant Hansen. And he gave a really wonderful illustration. He gave me a new way of thinking about the fruit of the Spirit, Paul's fruit of the Spirit. I'm going to read this passage to you. Paul wrote in Galatians 5, through 23, that Fruit from God is this stuff, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So if you happen to bump into a tree or shake it, bother it, or threaten it, see what falls. Was it love, gentleness, or something else? Sometimes it's jealousy, anger, and power plays. Now you see what kind of a tree it is. Jesus was betrayed, abandoned, and publicly humiliated, and while his life was being ripped from him. He prayed for forgiveness for the very people who were killing him. He intervened to, intervened to defend them. Bump into a tree and see what falls. Sometimes it's love and self-control. Now you see what kind of a tree it is. He goes on to share a little bit of a personal story here, a bizarre personal story. I was told by a CEO of a high-profile Christian ministry that I'd slandered him on Facebook. I had personally attacked him, he said, saying misleading and personal things. Sure, I might think it's just social media or I, I have the First Amendment right, but his lawyer told him that he had a great case against me and he told me he'd use his lawyer before to crush people. And now this was a legal matter. I formulated a brilliant legal response, which I'll quote here in verbatim. Uh, what? <laughs> I had no idea what he was talking about. And he, and he now knows I hadn't written a single word about him. He'd been lied to by another ministry leader in the organization. He's decades older than I am, and 
one would hope, a mature believer. But when his reputation was seemingly threatened, he decided to attempt to intimidate. Never mind the scriptural prohibitions against suing a Christian brother, the lack of evidence, or the fact that a thing would be profoundly out of character for what he knows of me. Bump into a tree and see what falls. Sometimes it's lawyers. Now you know what kind of a tree it is. How does all this fit with worry? Well, if we bump into a worrier, there are sometimes certain fruits that fall from that tree. When we bump into a worrier, sometimes we see, we see complaining fall from that tree. It's kind of like the Israelites in the desert who who had all the food they could eat, but then started to complain because it wasn't tasty enough. And when we value something deeply and it doesn't go our way, we complain. We don't like it. Sometimes you bump into the tree, you bump into the warrior, and anger falls out. We lash out. Because it, it's supposed to be different. When Jesus, who is our model, he experienced instability all over the place, and he turned the other cheek. Sometimes when we bump into a warrior, we experience complaining, we experience anger, but we also experience somebody who, who likes to take control. They're the, they're the my way or the highway kind of people. And often other people get kicked off the highway, get kicked off of their road because of it. So there's real fruit to worry. But the problem is a little bit bigger because how do we address worry? Have you ever met a worrier in your life who has loved being a worrier? I haven't. I mean, think about it. Think about it. There are thieves that, that are just thrilled with the, with the act of stealing. There are gluttons that just love to eat more food. But can you imagine going to a, or hearing from a worrier, I'm so worried about that test tomorrow. What a thrill. <laughs> Not at all. That song from 1988, it's, uh, what's his name? I can't remember. You know the song, Don't Worry, Be Happy. Have you ever heard a warrior singing that song? I've never heard a warrior singing that song. Let me give you some advice. If you know a warrior, don't tell them, don't worry, because it's not going to sink. It's not going to work. You want to know the antidote to worry? That's in Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34, where Jesus is going to tell us not to worry. I'll try to explain that when we get there. We'll try to work through that. So let's read Matthew 6, 25 through 34. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or stow away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father, he feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. And that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire. Will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run, around, run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So let's first begin by talking about the elephant in the room. It doesn't make sense to tell a worrier not to worry. And what does Jesus do? He says, do not, do not worry. So, you know, if you're a thinking person and you're like, well, the pastor said this and Jesus said that, you know, I'd give Jesus the benefit of the doubt. But let's think about this a little bit deeper here because Jesus doesn't just stop 
there. He doesn't just say, don't worry, just don't worry about it, and then move on to the next subject. He develops it. And the first thing that he does is he says, look, look at this, look at this. In other translations, that word is translated, consider these things. Consider the birds, such tiny little animals, but God feeds them. He takes care of them. Consider the flowers, how beautiful they are. They don't go to Old Navy to purchase their clothes, but they're more beautiful than King Solomon or a modern example, Beyonce. I don't know. (laughs) Consider the green grass. If you didn't fertilize it too much, it has the beautiful green all over it. But the grass, it's temporary. it's, It's here today, it's gone tomorrow. Your soul is not temporary. Your soul lasts forever. Is your soul not more valuable than grass, than birds, than flowers? And the answer, of course, is yes. Your soul certainly is. What's Jesus trying to do here? Jesus is trying to not only say don't worry, but he's trying to increase and buttress his listener's faith. And we know that because at one moment in verse 30, he says, oh, ye of little faith, as we know it, or oh, you of little faith. It's one word in the Greek. He calls them people with little faith. Now, when I read that, sometimes I read it because maybe I'm a little bit guilty, but I read it with a finger being wagged at me. Oh, you of little faith. Don't you know better? We know Jesus to be gentle and kind and caring. So when I think about it, I read it a little bit more. Oh, you who have little faith, will he not much more clothe you? And the answer is yes. Yes, he will. So the first principle that Jesus gives us is to consider the machine working all around us, the little ways that he provides for little things so that you know how much he values you as an individual. And in other places in Scripture, at another place, he says that he knows how many hairs you have on your head. Even if you only have one hair on your head, he knows it. He has them all counted because he cares about you, because he values you. And you may be thinking, oh yeah, you're talking about the guy next to me in the seat. Not talking about the guy next to you in your seat or the girl next to you in your seat. He is talking about you. He values you So he cares for you, and he will provide for you. So the first principle that Jesus teaches us is don't worry, but in order to do so, consider consider the machine and how nature works all around us, and also know that he values you. Now the problem that comes up for thinking people, like I know that you are and I like to pretend to be, is we overthink things like this, or we think about all of the what ifs and the buts. We think about people who starve, right? Because people do starve. We think about the starving kids, Compassion International, and yes, we can help some, but we can't help them all. We think about those and we say, God, I'm not sure about that. We think about the kids caught in the cave halfway across the world that are trying to be saved right now. What about them? What about those, God? What's interesting is that Jesus' context, it wasn't more free from suffering and more free from pain. In the Western world, we have pockets of poverty around us, but not like poverty that they had. They had poverty all over the place. So experiencing hunger was common and widespread in Jesus' day. So when he's talking to his audience, he's talking to a group of people who knew it and experienced it, on a regular basis. They're not ignorant. They're not playing, you know, fools with Jesus here. They know what he's talking about. The difference is this. Our culture today, the the hidden secret is that our culture has an intolerance for pain. We have an intolerance for pain. We're embarrassed about it. We don't like to talk about it. We're more comfortable in our culture talking about intimacy, openly, flaunting it, then we are about talking about pain and we are about talking about death. But the truth is that pain 
is in this earthly life, in this life now, is part of the palette of our human existence. As difficult as that is for us, pain can be a valuable thing for our personal growth. And yes, even death can be valuable when you see something beyond, when you look beyond it. So although Jesus doesn't state it, there's something implied from the context from the people that, he's listening, that he is speaking to. And, and, and that idea is this. We must, we must recognize that pain, that pain does exist and we need to leave room for disappointment and hurt because the story does not end here in this life. The story doesn't end here in this life, which, which brings us to our next point. But I, I, just, I just have one story I want to share because this is raw for us. All of us here have, have people who have been hurt and, and we've been touched by pain, we've been touched by loss. I was a camp counselor after, uh, after high school uh, at a small camp and, and they separated these camps by teams. Uh, the first year I met a young girl, a young freshman girl from the town, a small town called Hallam. And she had her house burnt down that year, but the, the town, they, they rallied around her. They rallied around her and they built a new house for her and her family. The next year, I did not see her. I heard that she was safe, and that was good news. But a tornado came and wiped that entire town off of the map. We live with things like this all the time. We know these stories, but we also know that this isn't the end. And if we're going to pretend like when Jesus came, he, he came to give us a perfect life in this present world, we're missing the promise of what's to come. And that's what he says next. In verse 33, he says, Seek ye first the kingdom and his righteousness. Seek ye first the kingdom and his righteousness. What is that thing, that kingdom? The kingdom means God's rule. And in the scripture, we find there are times when the kingdom is now, is present. He talks about the kingdom breaking in. And you can see it because Jesus was casting out demons. So the kingdom is present because the spirit is at work in the world doing amazing, wonderful things. But most of the time that we see that word kingdom, it's talking about the future. It's talking about something that is yet to come, something that we have yet to look forward to because the world is not the way that it is supposed to be. So the third principle is this. When we are facing worry, we, we need to prioritize God, his kingdom, and his righteousness, so much so that all the other things basically become passing thoughts because when we let our hearts focus on and we, we let the things of God, his future kingdom, and his righteousness occupy our hearts, when we let that be the focus, there's not going to be a whole lot of room for anything else. Which brings us to this idea of belief that we need to reconsider. We need to reconsider what belief is because belief in the world has kind of become something different. When I was a kid, my dad had a little wood block with a poster on it of a cat hanging. You've seen these, right? It said, hang in there, Henry. And uh, yes, there it is. It's funny, before the internet came, cats were still really popular. They were on posters, though. Hang in there. And that's kind of this... Uh, kind of fits this, the philosophy of this world. Just, just hang in there. And I was reminded of this poster in the movie, the Lego movie, which featured another poster from the 1970s and 80s that just has a cat jumping up and says, believe. <laughs> just believe. Believe in what? <laughs> I don't know. Just, just believe. It doesn't matter. Don't think about it too much. It'll hurt your head. Believe. But we know that the content does matter. What we believe in is his kingdom coming and his righteousness. Not our righteousness, but the righteousness that God gives us that we can obtain. When we focus on all those things, when we focus on the things that he wants us to believe and the things that he wants us to think about, all of our worries, all of those other things, they become secondary. But Jesus promises this, that all those things will still be added unto you, whether it's in this life or whether it's in the next life. People that most enjoy God's earthly provision are the people that dwell on it the least. You may feel like, ah, 
you don't know my story. You don't know, you don't know the reasons that I have for doubt. And I just don't know that I can believe. I just don't know that I can believe what you're saying. I don't know that I can be a person of faith that holds to the promises of God here. And you might think, well, maybe, you know, maybe it's just that thing in me that believes. We'll call it the believe a jig It's broken. But we all believe in something. Your believe a jig is not broken. It may just not be focused on the right thing. A story of God's provision from our church family. Uh, it was, uh, this was shared with me a couple weeks ago, and I want to I share it with you. Uh, uh, a family in our church, one of their children desperately needed a pair of shoes, and a special pair of shoes for the needs he had, so mom prayed. And then mom found a $20 bill. I'm going to share the rest of the story in her words. I arrived at the shoe box, hopeful, but not expecting anything. I don't normally shop for shoes at the shoe box. Most of the shoes there are, are good brand names at discounted prices. Translated, this means that you can buy a pair of $90 shoes for $60. But my son's feet were a youth's size six at the time, an almost impossible size to find, and I had already checked all the Walmart-like stores around. Oh, but did I mention his uh, fine motor skill difficulties and, couldn't, and he couldn't tie his shoes? We needed to find Velcro ties on a U-size 6. Yeah, right. We walked in and went straight for the back room and the clearance section. The clearance section is the we've got to get rid of these things section and is generally a mishmash of sizes and styles. To my shock, there were three pairs of U-size 6 sneakers, a miracle in and of itself. The very first pair I picked up were Skechers. Not bad. Youth's size six. Good. With Velcro ties, not shoelaces. I did a double take. Really? Yes, indeed. Velcro tie boys' shoes. Skechers, no less. Youth size six. And the price? Yep, they were exactly $20. Now, those are rare and special circumstances. They don't happen all the time. But that doesn't mean that God isn't involved in the moments that we feel like he's not involved. You might have worked really hard to earn the paycheck that brings that, that supper to the table, but God, God is still involved in that process. You might, uh, you might be struggling right now at work and, and wondering if your boss is going to have a bad day and, and really spoil your time. Or you might be really deeply concerned about the health of a loved one. Your natural response in those circumstances might be to let those thoughts roll around in your mind, let them, let them dig deep in your heart, and you might be a warrior, and you might just fester on those thoughts. But I, I want to invite you to imagine something different. Imagine a different response. First, consider all of the small ways that God is working all around you. How he, he feeds the squirrels that are running around in your backyard. How he clothes the, the trees in New England in these beautiful multicolored coats. Consider the ways that God responds. Think about those ways that he responds to the little things and know that you are much more valuable than those things. Secondly, recognize, recognize and and know that pain is still a part of this world and allow for some disappointment and frustration in the process. But finally, put his kingdom first. Prioritize his kingdom. Your journey of righteousness with God, put that very first because when you put those things first in your mind and your heart, your heart and your mind, they're not gonna have a whole lot of room for anything else. Let's pray. Father, you are, you are our powerful, good, and holy provider. We thank you, God, that you have met our needs in so many ways. And we, we ask forgiveness, God, that there have been so many times that we, we have not recognized the ways that you have worked in our lives because we only look at the very surprising ways and we fail to see the ways that you continually 
provide our needs in our work and our lives. God, we ask for forgiveness for that. But we also ask for encouragement. Help us to see, God, the ways that you provide for little things and give us the courage to know that you are involved in our lives because you care about us, because you know us by name. You know the hairs on our head and you love us. In Jesus' name. Let's stand together as we close today. I want to pray this prayer together that Jesus taught us to pray, and and it addresses a lot of the concerns that we have in our lives. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
as we go ahead and close our service for the day, we want to invite you to join us for refreshments out in the foyer to get to know one another and just spend some time together. We also want to invite you to give. The Bible says, and Jesus says in particular, that it is more blessed to give than receive. And you can give several ways. Through the offering in the back, you, back you can text or you can give online at ccnh.org. Finally, if you have anything that you would like to pray for, the elders will be up here at the front to pray for you and with you after service. What God provides for us is not just a pacifier. It's something real. It's something tangible. It's, it's hope. And he gives it to us in the midst of very difficult times and times that will still be challenging. But the hope is in the future that God will come and bring in, bring his kingdom. And as we focus on his righteousness and as we're made whole, we have that promise for new life. Have a great week. And don't forget to look for opportunities to celebrate people and discover God.